Hello. Uh, welcome to this uh, edition of Feeds the Living. Uh, today's the day that uh, we're going to talk more about what I talked last uh, episode was the fact that we can have peace in the middle of all the ugliness of this world. Now, I've struggled with it since I've done the last program to figure out what's this and what's that. But I've got to tell you, you know, happy, what is happy? To start with, if you're going to be happy, that means you're content. That means everything's okay and your life is going as well as it could. But to me, happy is a word that just kind of eludes me at the time because I'm trying to figure out what this life has for me. You know, the, the greatest thing I like is being a pastor for five and a half years and, and doing the street ministries and all of that, dealing with other people. My goal in life and what makes me happy is seeing someone else that's not capable of creating happiness in their life and being able to uh, give a word to them or, or help them in some way that they're not able to do. Not, you know, it, it's not a financial thing for me, but I've always reached out and tried to change the way, somebody's life for a little bit, even for a moment. And my heart is really burst out when I see someone so appreciative of a small gesture. So I, my, my sole purpose, I believe, and it does make me happy, when I see someone that that just doesn't have life in her, nobody pays attention to them, uh, they're dirt poor, they can't move, and you move in there and you give them a word of appreciation, you uplift them, maybe give them a little gift or take them to lunch or to whatever, and that smile that comes across their face and them eyes that start shining, now that's what makes me happy. But, you know, here of lately, I've been not just watching the news and, and getting the news. Now, that'll suck your happiness right out of your heart because the ugliness that goes on. So the first thing we got to do is quit allowing the ugliness of the world to influence our emotions. Because I find myself thinking about the dumb things I see people doing and then I see the hurting people that, that really have no idea what's going on. Uh, they're the ones that need the attention, not all these. Who cares? And, and what I see uh, the lady uh, Hollywood actresses, uh, I, I read more than five times in the last couple of weeks where they celebrated by going topless here. They celebrated by having nude, being nude out on the beach. They celebrated their body because who gives a rat's rear about their body when people are out here dying and starving and carrying on? Get a grip, Hollywood. I mean, my goodness. Uh, you get naked to celebrate your birthday? You get naked to celebrate a, a new opening? Come on. You, the These things are the... That's the ugliest thing I see about Hollywood. And I read it more than five times in prominent women that are in Hollywood that could make a difference influencing young girls that you don't need your body to go anywhere. You use your mind and your personality and who you are. You know, I, I, I just couldn't understand it, you know. I got naked because it was a nice day and I wanted to let everybody know how happy I was. Well, you accomplished one thing. I felt that was about the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. If I got naked every time I got happy, I'd probably be in jail. So the, the key thing is this. Happiness needs to dwell around something besides sexual ugliness. 
and people claiming this is what rolls this world around. No, what rolls this world around is true love. It's having a true love in your life. Let me, I promise you this, if you don't have someone in your life that you love dearly and they love you, then that's what's missing in your life. Now, if you got somebody that's griping at you from the time they get up until the time they go to bed, I'm sorry, but it's time to get on down the road. I mean, I don't care if you've been married for 100 years. Uh, I've seen people in my lifetime, i just seen misery handed out. I, I just couldn't believe a person want to live their life being belittled and put down every day of their life. That can't be happiness. Uh, they start putting me down and, and making things ugly for me. Well, I'm gone. I'm heading out somewhere else. But I've been very happy for my marriage as far as that goes. So now the rest of my life I had to struggle with. But my question today is, for me, is, you know, what, what am I doing here? Why am I still here? And if I knew the answer to that, I wouldn't have to ask the question. So the next thing I thought of was quit asking questions and start doing something about it. Just because I'm 81 years old and I'm very healthy, I can get around, I work on things, I do things, and uh, I, I'm out there, I do things. So instead of wondering why I'm not dead, I need to start appreciating why I'm living. And I believe there's many people. I met a lady that was 70 years old in a restaurant. And she looked older than I did. She had more, she definitely had problems and she had issues. And I've been meeting these people that 10, 15 years younger than me. So instead of me asking why, I need to start loving life, living life. In order to do that, I have to do something different. You can't do the same thing over and over again. You know what they say and expect the same results. That's insanity. Well, I've been insane all my life. And, it's, and at 81, I can stop that. Or I can just keep going till I die and then realize, well, my goodness, why didn't I change? Because, see, what I look forward to and what the Word of God says is to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. So I'll be fine then. It's what I do on earth depends on whether I'm happy here or not. It's what I do here. I, You know, I have this issue that I was born into dirt poor. Didn't know it until I was 10 or 11 years old. I, and I thought we was top of the line, you know, playing on a dirt field in front of my front of our house. Lucky enough, we had a house. And my mom was, uh, uh, my dad left when I was four years old. And my mom didn't have a job, didn't have anything. Raising three boys. And I was the worst one of the three. And always demanding. And not ever given any thought to her. So that really has affected me in my life because it's real easy to see what you should have done for someone after they leave. That's why we need to look around and say, you know what? I love this person with all my heart. Why don't I just do something now instead of waiting till it's over, tell everybody how good they were? You see, both, I, both of my brothers are gone now. My mother's gone. My father's gone. And uh, nieces, nephews, and a son, all gone. That's why today we're going to talk about transition. When my son died, a day before he died, I had a son. And he was a good kid. Troubled just like most all the other ones. He was 34 years old. So the day before he died, I have a son. The day after he died, I had to have a transition. 
But I first had to deal with the death of my son. Because if I would have dragged that into the, what I've already dealing with, you see, that was the obstruction that come into a life that was going pretty good. I was pastoring then. I was, uh, everything was going good. The church was in good shape. And uh, everything was good. But obstructions can come immediately. When he died, I, then I had to do a transition. I had to learn to live this life without him in it. Now, you may think, well, you know, he's gone. That's just how it is. No, because your involvement with that person, 34 years old, he'd been in my life for 34 years. And when he died, that means I had to transition from being a father of a 34-year-old young man to a man that didn't have a son. He had an older brother, which he's still with us today, but at that time, I didn't, I no longer had that son. So that means I had to transition from the death of my son to being only one son and one daughter left before there was three children. So today we're going to talk about transition. And transitions don't have to deal with death, but that's part of it. And as, like I was talking to Mike before we started, and so I told him there was no, you cannot have a transition until you have an ending. If something doesn't end, you can't trans, transcend to something else. So the response was, so you mean you can't transcend or quitting drugs eventually? Then I realized, well, no, it doesn't matter whether it's going on a little bit or you're putting up with the drugs or every day you're using a little bit less. And It's when you use that last drug, that very last drug, that's an ending, the beginning of the transition. You can't transcend to another life still doing the same thing you were doing because you're just bringing the problem into another area. That's all you're doing. And first, now, I want to clarify something. Number one, I'm not a psychologist. I have no PhD. Uh, I have, a, I have a, a diploma from the Oakeville Tribune down in uh, Stockton, California, where uh, life's life, things that happen. That's who I am. I learned everything I know, and I know they're right because I lived them. I know when you love somebody and they don't love you, you're going to be miserable. I know when you love somebody and they love you, and things are wonderful, and you have somebody to lift you up. So what I'm talking about in transition, once you begin to know that there's something not right in your life, you need to discover what that is. And you need to end that. You need to take a look and see, is there anything in my life that I need to keep? And what things in my life do I need to let go of? Because if you don't do that, before you transcend to this other person of this other life, you just you're creating a double whammy on you because you're taking the old problem and into this new venture, and then eventually you're going to end up in the same position, only twice as much problems. That's why suicide is so prevalent today. People are not getting rid of their problems until they start, before they start a new life. If you start something, that'd be like uh, having two flats, fixing one and driving on the other. What's the use? Why, why would it? That's not smart. So what I'm telling you today, and I hope I can get it across because I want you to know, anything I talk about here, I've lived it. I mean, you got you to gotta get a grip on that one. I'm 81 years old. When I first discovered I was in places that I wouldn't welcome, it broke my heart. 
And in 2018, I decided to do something about it. So what I did was I started cutting people out of my life. And according to what's going on right now, I've done a pretty good job. I've got two phones, and I don't get enough calls for a half one. So what I'm telling you is it was very hard for me to meet new people because, you see, people lie to you, maybe not intentionally. They say, oh, yeah, man, how great you are. I love you, and you're a great guy. Then the next day, they're out there telling everybody what an idiot you are and all the dumb things you've done, and they remind everybody of all the dumb things you ever did. And, uh, you know, I run into that. My flesh and blood put me down. My in-laws, they taught me a great lesson. But you know what? Both of those are no longer an issue inside my heart because I've, I've dealt with that and I've, and there's what you have to do. You have to deal with it. You have to put it away. I want to tell you that was a struggle. But I know I wasn't the only one out there with this kind of problem. Don't let people tell you to your face how great you are and talk trash about you after you're gone or whoever will listen. When I found out I had been places that I wasn't welcome, it was hard to deal with people. I mean, it because you never know. You know what's great is to have somebody in your life that loves you enough to tell you the truth. I only have one person in my life that does that, and that's my daughter-in-law, Judy. You need that person in your life. My own wife, she won't tell me the truth. And it's not because she wants to lie to me, it's just because she doesn't want to hurt my feelings or doesn't want to, she's always uplifting me. Whether I'm right or wrong, she stands up for me. And that's all well and good. But you need someone in your life that has enough love for you to tell you the truth. When you're out there doing something stupid, when you're saying something stupid, probably like this program, or anything else is to tell you, hey, that wasn't right. You need to get a grip of this and that. You need someone that you can trust. The only way you can trust them is if they love you enough, they'll be honest with you. So today what I want to do is I want to begin to try to just convey, because if I can't help you, I definitely don't want to hurt you. I want to try to convey to you what what really goes on is uh, in my heart once I figured it out that I wasn't a good person and I all I have was interested in what was good for me then after my mother died I it broke my heart that I wasn't able to get a point to be able to tell her but anyway we need to clear that old stuff out. I've dealt with this, I'm telling you about, a long time ago. But you have to deal with it. You can't just act like it's not there. If you ignore it, it'll erupt at the worst of times. I'm going to tell you a story about a man in my life today that I first met this guy through a church and we uh, we hit it off, and he's a friend of my friend. And so I began to talk to him and consider him a friend. But then I get, began to notice he was doing something that was kind of, uh, it really was zero business of mine, but I seen him doing things that was affecting my friend. So I never said anything about it, but it kept building up inside. And I'm, I'm thinking, wow, why would he do this? Why would he do that? And again, I want to make sure it was absolutely none of my business. But see, as a year went by and, and this is building up, and I don't even know it's building up, but I'm watching this and not in favor of it. So one day we're at this function. 
and we begin discussing a topic about certain things going on and and he was saying things uh, all of a sudden I fell into this anger and I told him I told I I might as well have cussed him out as to how bad it was and I was very rude to him and I told him I didn't care what he thought or what he'd done or anything else about it I you know I don't care what you think well then I so I get angry I'm headed to my car well then my friend comes up to me and says something then I got mad at him and so I told him look I'm done with you guys you, you know this is it I'm done I got in my car slammed the door and went back home so I'm kicking back being very mad figuring out how I'm going to cut these guys totally out of my life and then this was on a Saturday night I mean I had a miserable time sleeping I got up the next morning and I tell you it's just wonderful to have God on your side because all of a sudden I recapped what went on I was 1000% in the wrong now what do I do about it well there's only one thing you do if you wrong somebody you go to them and ask for forgiveness and whatever so I call him up I couldn't wait till 7 or 8 o'clock whatever time I felt was appropriate had a hard time finding his phone number but I called him up begged his forgiveness, told him how sorry I was, and that, and that. And then I called the other friend up, begged his forgiveness, and they were both very cordial and very good. And so I felt good. But two weeks later, I began to read the Word and then talk, you know, think about things. Why did I do that? All of a sudden it made me realize for that entire year, I had been feeding off of the ugliness I'd seen what I thought was wrong doing, which he took care of already, but at the time it wasn't. So I said, oh, my goodness. So I'm going to tell you what happened next. And this is what the deal is. You can't just blow up, say I'm sorry, and walk off. There's got to be more to it than that. So I dug deep into it, and I went to a function, and he was there, and I said, I need a minute of your time. And I took him off to the side, and I said, I need to tell you the honest truth. And I told him how I resented him all year, what I seen him doing and what, what was going on and all that. And he admitted, well, yeah, I probably shouldn't have done it. But the key thing was this. I poured my heart out to him. I told him, look, I truly, truly see that this was absolutely none of my business, and here I go into you holding this inside of me without even knowing it, and the moment we had any kind of words, it exploded. So I just told him I was sorry, and I loved him, and I thought he was a great guy, and I'm going to tell you what. I cried, he cried, and it was a new time. That was a transition that went from ugly to the best it could possibly go. Today, every time I see him, he just shines, and every time he sees me, he just shines. We have a connection because we were honest with one another, I, and I didn't even know how to be th that honest. But I said, what do I have to lose? Because if he gets angry with me, so what? But no, he accepted it. He appreciated it. If you have people in your life that you've been thinking about how bad they are, but you're not telling them, you don't go and curse them out. You go in there and tell them what you know and how you feel. And, uh, and if it's a relative or whatever, you need to try to save that. Because the Word of God said, if you have a problem with somebody, go to that friend. And if... If you heal the situation, then you have got a new friend. 
and a solid friend. And I want to tell you what, my friend that we have now, that connection, that and we we have a solid relationship. It was exactly what God said it would be, is I have a stronger friend, a way beyond what it was before. And I know I can't be the only one on this planet with, they say this coming year there's supposed to be 8 billion people on this planet. I can't be the only one that feels that. So I'm, I'm looking around here for a clock, but I don't see one, and I don't know what time it is, so I'm sure Mike's going to tell me. Yeah? About halfway. Okay. Now, here's what we're going to do. If Mike says we're halfway, we're halfway. And we're going to take a little break, and we're going to come back, and I'm going to try to assemble this all together where it'll make some kind of sense. God bless. Gained a lot, learned a lot, and got a lot of love. If it weren't for the knowledge that I had gained, from the classes at PCC, I probably wouldn't be the mom I am today. See, there it goes. I would love you to meet my son, Aaron. My situation was very difficult. I didn't know how my life was going to turn out. We graduated in June yeah. 2010, and we got married in July. And through family, the Pregnancy Care Center changed our lives. The Pregnancy Care Center was a huge, vital part in helping me walk through that pregnancy, in educating me and loving on me during that time. Sometimes good intentions hurt rather than help. For just $1.76 per meal, the Fresno Rescue Mission offers more than food. We offer hope. Please donate today. Well, we're talking about transitions. I got caught up in a lot of little stories there, but they're absolutely, there's a benefit to be doing what the Word of God says. Now, if you don't have God in your life, well, you can still deal with these things, but the only, I, ne I was never able to deal with these things until I did get God in my life. But everybody can't be like me, because if they was, we'd have a messy world. To start with, transitions are important. Because if you stay in a miserable situation that you're in, you'll be miserable till you die. Now, I want you to know for sure that my lights went out. Okay. Now, here we go. Uh, yeah, oh, just true. just having a little bit of difficulty there, but everything is all good right now. Uh, the transition. Here's what you need to do. If you've got a situation in your life and you need to make a transition, you first need to look inside yourself, and you need to be very painfully truthful 
to who, who you are and what you need to do. Now, I've seen these people that if, if you say anything about anything, it ends up being them. Now, that can't be your life. If that's your life, can you imagine how many people are discussing you, laughing and carrying on? Because I know people that begin to talk and it doesn't matter what you talk about. It always goes back to them. Now, they're it. No matter what. It doesn't matter. So if you're one of those, you need to get a grip and know that there's other people on this planet and they wouldn't all put here to satisfy you. So the key thing for me is to have true happiness inside. Now, it doesn't matter what other people think. Now, see, that's the first thing a transition has to work off. You've got to cut out other people's opinions. You can listen to them, but you can't take them as part of your program. You need to create your own program. You need to create who you are, and you need to find out what purpose, what purpose do you want to do on this earth? Are you happy doing? You know, I've been reading some stories. These millionaires, they just they gave up they gave up fame and fortune because they what they wanted to do didn't have anything to do with fame and fortune. Some of them went to work for nonprofits and some of them uh, just started helping people. See, cause there, there's such satisfaction into walking up to someone that you know has been hurting. Maybe they lost a loved one, and it, they haven't got over it. And you become the, the lightning rod that gives them hope. You're the one that begins to speak into their heart. And, you, you know, we all have to grieve. I've lost so many relatives. When you get my age, you kind of outlive the people you grew up with. I've done a lot of funerals of my friends. So you need, there has to be a grieving time. You know, the worst case scenario is cancer is, is a terrible way to go, and it's, it's terrible. So that's even beyond understanding. So, but when they pass, you have to have a grieving time. You can't start a new transition in the midst of grieving. You need to grieve and, and, and know in reality that Nothing can be changed that happened in the past. Nothing. I mean, it's an impossibility. Whatever word come out of your mouth, whatever deed that you've done, good or bad, you cannot change it. You cannot re-script it. You cannot deal with it in any way, shape, or form. So that's the first thing you need to cut out of the new transition. You there's no reason to bring the ugliness of the past in if you can't do anything about it. And you know that light went out. Everything's working good. Huh? Everything's working good. Everything's working good. There's just no picture. Okay. All right. Well, I'll just keep on. I, uh, uh, I lost my sight there for a minute. Can't see myself talk. All right. Now, but the key thing is this. If you grieve enough, and you get past that, then you finally realize the transition of that death has taken place. And you have began to be into the new form. And uh, then, oh, we're back again. And uh, so the new form is the new life. But it's just without your friend, without your loved one. You know, when life is really going on and everything is nice, it's great all of a sudden something would happen somebody gets attacked by cancer uh, an accident happens someone gets hurt in an accident life changes I mean life change I was going to work one morning about 6 a.m. in the morning down in Stockton 
And I had a gate that it was electrically run, and it didn't work, so I had to physically open it up. And I was driving a Jaguar at the time, and I thought I put it in park, and I pushed the gate open, and the car started moving. The door was open. It knocked me down and run over my foot and then parked right on top of it. And then I had to pull my foot out from under it, and I mean agonizing pain, but I got it out from under it. Then it started heading for a ditch across the street. So I had to get up on a club foot, chase it down, jump into it, and stop it just before it went into the ditch. So then I pulled the car back up, went back into the house, and my wife and I, I mean, I had to laugh. I mean, who gets run over by their own car? I did. And it was early in the morning. I, I needed to go to San Jose to do a job. And I mean, it hurt. It ached. It swole up bigger than that. See, that changed. That stopped everything. That stopped my income. That stopped who I was. It just, it's something that come along that we can't do. Now, and it's not so much what happens to you. It's how you react to it that's going to determine whether you're going to make it or whether you're just going to call it quits. And I tell you, at the doctor's office a couple of times, I was about ready to call it quits. But then pretty soon they, they got it wrapped up and everything, and I just started working with it. But see, life can deal you things that are totally unexpected. I mean, the reason I live in Southern California is because I crashed a pickup truck I was driving in the rear end of a guy at 55 miles an hour. Lucky I didn't die. If you've seen the picture of the truck, you'd think I did. But the key thing is this, that stopped everything. We had a large warehouse, we had a house. Financially, wasn't doing good even when that happened. Then when that happened, it totally threw things out. So there was a transition. I've been living there 15, 16 years. All of a sudden, uh, I can't meet obligations, and uh, you got to take action to, to stay alive. So I ended up buying a home in Tulare, California, downsizing, way downsizing, buying a little piece of junk. It's not now, but it was when we bought it. But anyway, that was a transition that I, I didn't think I was going to survive. I didn't know I was going to have a place to live. I was thinking I might be one of the homeless of this California. But when you stand up and you believe in yourself and when you start doing things, you can't think about the, what the ending project's going to be. You just got to do it. You've got to be in there day to day doing what you need to do, not laying up on the couch whining and crying and carrying on. You need to be getting up. You need to do something. I mean, it was hard for me to get up. It was hard for me to, to do. Uh, but I started uh, doing what I'd done best, surviving. I've never been homeless in my life, and I didn't want to start at 70-something years old. So the struggle of transition is worth it. But if you don't struggle, that's why the streets are full of homeless people. It's voluntary or involuntary, either one. It was created by them or it was put on them by somebody else. Now, I, I know people personally that their mate died and they might as well crawl in that box with them because they were done. I mean, they never hit a positive note after that. I mean, I'd miss my wife terribly if she went, and uh, it would break my heart. But the life goes on. I mean, I've lost, like I said, many people, and just some people have lost their whole family. So I feel blessed to be where I am now. But the key thing is, I'm at a point at 81 years old transitioning into something 
that I don't know anything about. You know, I've done a lot of things in my life. I've had more transitions than I've had birthdays. But I'm going to tell you this. Every transition, you should learn something out of it, and the next one shouldn't be as hard. Now, when you're dumb as I am, every single one of them basically was the same thing. It was all with the same reasoning, and it just woke up one day and said, wow, you know, I'm in the insanity mode. I'm doing the same thing all the time over and over again, expecting different results. So even me, at my age, I'm looking for what the world's got as an opportunity for me to get into. Now, I, I want you to know transitions are important because if you don't do it, what are you going to do? You're going to be miserable till you die. Here's the first thing you got to do. You have to forgive yourself. If you don't forgive yourself, you can't make another step. Because if you're just doing this saying, boy, I was really dumb when I'd done that, but hopefully I'll be better this time. No, it goes deeper than that. You need to take that forgiveness and use it inside you. You need to know that you're capable standing up and doing something else. You need to be confident in who you are. You need confidence that you've got a goal that you can achieve. I mean, at 81, I'm not, I, I'm not going to go uh, and talk about winning the decathlon or something. I'll go win a boxing match against Ali, you know, which, well, I would now because he's gone. But the key thing, what I'm saying is keep the goal in the position it needs to be in. Now, there's a lot of things I can do. And I, there's a lot of things I know. I know a little bit about everything. But I don't know everything about anything. So that's the key thing you have to know. What do you know? What do you feel? What do you want to do? What's your heart say? That, who are you supposed to be? Now me, I've wrote a book. I've, I've had three, four different businesses were successful at the time. Laws and things change and positions change. You have to get out of them. I sprayed fiberglass over existing swimming pools for 16 years. I had a boat repair shop. I repaired boats. I built uh, boats out of fiberglass. I... Uh, a general contractor. We done concrete for six, seven years. Uh, so I've done pretty much <coughs> everything, but I really didn't know everything about anything for sure. I know that, uh, you know, I know this. Life is real. And if you treat it for anything else other than what it is, you'll be miserable till you die. Your eyes need to look at reality. One in one always makes two. If you look at something and one in one comes up three, then you better not deal with it. Reality. Reality in your expectations, reality in who you are, reality in your capabilities. I mean, I've always jumped in the middle of something and in the middle and worked my way out to the end and never knew anything about the beginning because I figured that was just dumb stuff. If you don't plan, if you don't plan out what you're going to do, where you're headed, you could end up anywhere. But if you plan on a goal, you got to find the love of your life. God wants you to find the love of your life and to deal with that. If you deal with the things of life and of what your heart loves to do, take money out of the equation. I mean, we got to have money to live. We know that. 
But if you take what you love and you start doing that one step at a time, just like in a transition, and you say, okay, this is what I want to do in life, and no matter how hard it is, I'm going to go in that direction, step by step. Next thing you know, you got more money and you know what to do with, and you didn't even know how you got it. When you go after just money, you know how you got it, and you wore yourself out, probably uh, discounted your values and all kinds of things. But when you go after what you love, money automatically comes. Because if you do what you love, you do it great, and people see that, and they want to be part of that. When you're in there after the money, you're after the, you don't care whether the product's any good or not. You just give me the money. Or you go in there and you're trying to build something. Uh, you don't care what it looks like. As long as you get the money, money becomes a God to you. And you no longer are able to enjoy making it. You just enjoy having it. And then you find out when you die, the people that didn't even like you is out there spending your money. So love is the thing that has to be in control. The love of what you want to do the love of people in your life, the love of what's going on in your life. If you're not happy and if you're not loving in, in your position in life right now, you need to start looking around and saying, I need love in my life. Why do you think people are committing suicide? It, it definitely not because everybody in the world loves them. It's because they believe in their heart. Nobody even likes them. Nobody cares for them. And they don't know how to reach out. So they say the only way to go is death. How many good people have left this earth because some idiot bullied them or somebody got on the Internet and talked bad about them or showed pictures of something that, you know, and they got to know things don't mean anything anymore. It doesn't matter what's going on. It matters who you are. It matters where you stand. It matters. It matters that love is in your life. And if you don't have love in your life and, if your family don't love you, kick them to the curb because the real family is people that love you and you love them. Family is great and it's wonderful and it's what made this U.S. It doesn't make it anymore because if you're part of a normal family, you're an idiot and you don't know anything. And it's just like them Democrats going out, and I'm not Democrat or Republican, so don't get toughy. It's like AOC and them Democrats, five or six of them went and got arrested. They're out there uh, picketing the court, the highest court in the land. The court that they're supposed to be representing, they're out there picketing them, and they arrested them. Oh, they, they, and I know they think they're so cool they did that, and they think that's going to help them, but I hope it hurts them more ways than one that I hope they don't, none of them ever get elected because they, number one, they're out there they're, just because they didn't like a decision. They're our lawmakers. They're the ones that should be supporting our court, and they're out there doing it. That's not love of country. As far as I'm concerned, they're absolutely against this country. They need to go somewhere. They need to go check out Putin. So anyway, enough of that. No politics. Uh, the transition of life is so much better if it's done with confidence and you're looking for the goal to be healthy. You're looking for that position of life. If you have children, if, you, if you're happily married, if you've got a family and, and you deal with things of that nature, Don't be miserable. You know, I find myself sometimes getting into the negative position. That's not a good feeling. It's not about where we're at. Changing geological positions is not going to help you. What needs to be changed is inside your heart. Don't think for a minute. If you hate the job you're at now, you need to get away from it and find one you like. But if you don't like your job and you don't want to quit, don't let it become the thing that brings you down to a suicidal thought. 
Now, suicide in this country is becoming an epidemic. Just like people getting killed by guns. People getting killed by cars. Every day you can read where somebody leaves this planet. But they didn't wake up that morning saying, okay, I'm going home today. Now, I don't know where their home is, heaven or hell. But let me tell you, you need to secure who you are. You need to secure where you're at. You need to be secure in what you're doing. And you need to be loved by the person you love. If you love somebody and they don't love you and you're trying to live with them, at the end of your life, you're going to say, wow, what a waste. What a waste. You need people that love you in your life. You need to love people in this life. Hanging out with people that are use you for the butt of their jokes. That's exactly why I'm confined to very few friends. Because, believe it or not, I can get out there sometimes, say things, you know, goof around and do things. And, but bottom line, I'm God's. I belong to God. How did it be foolish for God and the smartest guy for the devil. All I can tell you is you can have peace. You can have love. But you can't have it sometimes in the position you're in. So that's why tra transitions are so important. Don't never take a transition till you end the one you're in. All it'll do is complicate, unhinge, make you miserable. Quit worrying about what other people think. Because for your life, it really doesn't matter. Get someone that you trust and you love. That they'll be able to tell you the truth when you're out there. And you need to accept it and say, okay. That, that's no part of me. Figure out what you need to hang on to. But figure out what you need to let go of. Then do it. And you're going to see a change in life that's going to bring peace, joy, simplicity. In a world of turmoil, simplicity is hard to find. But it's the best kind. Get up in the morning. Be glad you did. And at the end of the night, be glad what you done during the day was a blessing to others, including yourself. So what I tell you today is I do rattle along quite a bit. But I do. I do know. That love is real. Liars don't need to be in your life. Those that say they love you and they care for you, and oh man, they'll do anything in the world for you until you need something. Those that say they love you and then talk bad about you behind their back, that makes them a liar. If they really loved you, they'd tell you what the problem was not everybody else. So, I'm blessed that this is coming to an end because I don't even know what I said myself. But here's what I've got to say for sure as we go. Is I love y'all and you need to write to me, email me, herb at herbkeener.com tell me how far I was out there or whether I was right on the mark of what you want to hear about. God bless you all. Have a great, great day.